as a wellness coach, I get to help people. NASM has invested in creating this program with the leading minds in neuroscience, movement, positive psychology, sleep, nutrition. You will learn a unique understanding of wellness. And I'm excited for you to take this course because there is nothing else like it in the fitness and wellness industries today. This is the course that I wanted five years ago, a gift in my mind to an industry that is thirsty for more. listeners, and welcome to another episode of the Better Than Fine podcast. I am your host, Arlene Marshall, and this is the first episode of 2023. Happy New Year. And I am beyond excited to be kicking off a new year here on the Better Than Fine podcast, talking about meaningful wellness practices. You know, it's the time of year when so many of us get flooded with, you know, let's be honest, they're toxic messaging around wellness and fitness. And it's aimed at making us not feel so great about ourselves, frankly, so that we'll buy stuff. And at the top of the show today, I want to welcome any new listeners who stumbled upon the show. Um, Welcome to what I like to cultivate as a safe space. And for long-term listeners, I want to reiterate, this is a body-neutral show focused on meaningful practices. Um, It's not this co-opted version of body positivity that is trying to push fake self-love wrapped up in that we need to change ourselves. And in a very genuine way, this show is built to recognize the bumps, the bruises, the challenges, the scars, the cellulite, the parts about ourselves that maybe we want to push away, but we're choosing to work with to welcome in to this concept of ourselves. You know, it's a part of you, it's part of me, those parts of ourselves that maybe are a little uncomfortable to be around. And sometimes we want to work on our wellness because we want to take care of ourselves because we do actually love and want the best for ourselves. So all that is to say, we're not going to push dieting or harmful messaging around that you need to change yourself. We're not here for the new year, new you. That is not our jam. Um, We're here about what a friend of the show, Jerry Dow, shout out Jerry. um, She recently called it a comment on an Instagram post I did about how much I hate new year, new you. She said, new year, more you, more authentic, more kind, and more of how I bring that into the world. And I wanted to share that comment with you because it feels like the essence of what Better Than Fine is about. The other thing I want to share at the top of the show is a little side project that I quietly launched over the holiday break. I'm calling it More Better, uh, which is a throwback to something I used to say to my clients. I work with a lot of people who have chronic illnesses, and I realized that asking them, oh, does that feel better, isn't fair to someone with a chronic illness because it's not going anywhere. The idea is that you just want to be a little more better, because if you've got a chronic illness, you ain't going to magically resolve it. And that's also part of the kickback of the name of this show. So More Better is a project where I'm collating some of the practices, the tools, the things we talk about on this show in a way that you can then use them for your own wellness. So it takes all the wisdom, collects it into a single place so that you have resources you can navigate for your own well-being. And you can find that collection of content at Substack, or excuse me, let's try that one again, coachdar.substack.com. And there's also links on Instagram and LinkedIn and anywhere else that you might be looking for it. So happy new year. It's my new year gift to you, a way that you can go out and find some more free resources for your own wellness and well-being. All right, so with all that out of the way, let's talk about what we're actually here to talk about today. So our guest, our first guest of 2023, 
was just, and when I say just, I mean like within the last couple of days, named one of Imbibe Magazine's 75 inspiring people and places that will shape the way you drink in 2023, which I think is pretty remarkable because while he is a bartender, he's actually an expert on no and low alcohol content, yeah, no and low alcohol cocktails, <laughs> and a leading advocate for mindful drinking. He's the author of Mindful Nixology, a comprehensive guide to no and low alcohol content, Co cocktails. I keep saying content instead of cocktails. That's got to change. <laughs> and he's also an NASM certified wellness coach. He is here in the world, not just here on BTF. He's here in the world to teach America how to drink. My friend, Derek Brown, welcome to the Better Than Fine podcast. Hey, Darlene, how are you? Thanks for I'm having me. Well. I'm so excited to have you here. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Me too. Absolutely. I'm glad so, to be here. Uh, you know, we're here to kick off and start the year, but also starting dry January. Uh, That's right. in, and I want to dive right in because you have so much to offer from a wealth of expertise, not only as a bartender, also from the wellness side and this whole new horizon that you bring to the table. And I want to start with a quote from the intro to Mindful Mixology. Um, you say, the quote is, I'm not averse to alcohol, I'm immersed in it. And it rang the bell for me because I feel like so often we talk about alcohol and wellness, we're talking about either like tannins and healthy drinking, or we're talking about like teetotaling, you're not going to have anything. It's evil, it's to be avoided. You don't buy into either. And I think that's such a fascinating place to start. So can you share with us your view on mindful drinking and where you fall in that conversation of alcohol and wellness. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think the first thing to note is that it's really not just within wellness and fitness, it's sort of everywhere. Like I feel that when I grew up, those were the only two things that I heard too, right? Either, you know, from my like brother and my friends, like let's drink, you know, like do shots and, uh, a beer bong might have been among the first things I ever drank, honestly. Wow. Um, and, you know, or don't do it, right? Like, I mean, I remember sitting in high school as they like flashed pictures of cars that were like crumpled and, you know, yeah. like uh, covered bodies from these drunk driving accidents. And, and it was like, wow, oh my God, you know, like, but that didn't, neither one of them really appealed to me in a way, although I was certainly more driven in that instance to follow, you know, my peers. And so I think that like very often we hear these messages that are either or, you know, drink or don't drink, but, but very seldom do we hear, all you have to do is drink with intention, right? And that's the essence of mindful drinking. It's not a complicated idea, although it certainly gets into a complicated territory. The idea is when you go to drink, do you know why you're drinking, what you're drinking, and do you stick to your plan, right? And so if you don't know why you're drinking, that's, I think it's a good, that's, that's a good thing to evaluate. If you don't know what you're drinking, then certainly taking time to say, this is what I like, this is what I don't like, this is good for me, this is not, for some reason doesn't, you know, work for me. Um, and then certainly if you're drinking more than you intend to, that's getting into a problem territory. And that's something you have to address um, for sure. Yeah, so I'm hearing there why you're drinking, what you're drinking, and the intention around how much. And it occurs to me a question, and you know I love it when I find a new good question, <laughs> but the question of how many people out there have actually thought about, like, why am I drinking? I think that's a really rich question. It is. And I mean, it's it's a daily question for some people, right? They might go to a, like a happy hour with their workmates or uh, maybe they go to a party or, you know, it's just like they're going out to dinner and automatically it's like, let's order wine, let's order beer, let's order cocktail. Um, it's part of our entertainment. It's part of our life on, on, on in so many different areas, especially during the holidays, right? I mean, it was, it's almost impossible to escape December without like a slew of drinks thrown at you, mm -hmm. right? And so if you don't have an intention behind that, you might end up overdoing it in a way that you don't like, right? And I just want to qualify something really quick. I'm not against people drinking at all, yeah. right? Like, and if, even if somebody wants to get tipsy or whatever, that's not necessarily a territory that I go into, right? Um, 
I, in fact, I say that I had a class called Holidays Without the Hangover, right? And how I opened the class was, I'm not allowed to say anyone's bad for drinking or having a hangover because I've had more hangovers than you'll ever have in your life, right? <laughs> I've already been there, I've already done that. Like I have no quali qualifications to say, you can't or you shouldn't do this. All I can say is that, is it what you intended to do, right? Is this what you sought to do? And if it's just kind of these drinks getting thrown at you, you know, and like eggnog and, you know, champagne and you have another glass and another glass and then you kind of end up in a, a feeling a way you don't want to feel, right? Like that's what it's about. It's not just drinking something you don't want to drink. It's feeling a way you don't really want to feel. Yeah, not just in the moment, but the next day, the day after, you know, I know you and I have talked a fair bit about um, the effects of alcohol, you know, specifically my interest is the effects of alcohol in the brain, but how shocked I was to learn how long the negative impact on the brain lasts and that it can take up to two months to start to shift back into like normative cognition when we're, so often we're thinking about like, okay, we want to feel really good the night we're partying and the next day is worth it or not worth it. Like this question of intentionality, not only being around the fun, but being around your total experience of yourself. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the way I try to say it is that there is no amount, there is no amount of alcohol that's healthy, yeah. right? Alcohol just isn't healthy. I know that you mentioned tannins and <laughs> ros resveratrol is something that like <laughs> yeah, popped up in the eighties or nineties with the French diet. And, and, and the amount of wine that you'd have to drink just to get the positive effect of the resveratrol is an, an enormous amount of alcohol in the first place, which would obviously not, you know, knock out any of the positive effects. And can't you um, just get it from like the grape skins anyway? Like you could just eat that many grapes. Like it's not something special about wine specifically, if I understand right. That's right. You can eat grapes. You could now at this point, you could take, um, you know, supplements. And not only that, I mean, most of the wines that you would drink, you know, like it's not in Yellowtail. Let's put it that way. Like <laughs> not, in yellowtail. Um, not to make fun of Yellowtail. Yeah, no I'm knocks on Yellowtail. Please don't sue us. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but yeah, so I think there's no amount of alcohol that's healthy, but you can live a healthy lifestyle that incorporates alcohol, right? I think yeah. that's, we've talked about this before. The fact is, I mean, people eat ice cream. There's, ice cream's not really healthy for you no. per se, you know? Um, so I think it's recognizing that this is something that can have danger, not dangerous, well, sometimes dangerous. Sometimes. It can have uh, effects that you, you, you weren't really bargaining for. That was not what you were in it for. And so whether that lasts a the day after and you wake up and you just feel like your head hurts and you're dehydrated or or two months later and you feel or, or for some people it moves into this territory where it's problem drinking it might not be alcohol use disorder right it not, might not be alcoholism as we more colloquially call it but it, it but it might venture into a territory we feel uncomfortable with and so i think that there's a whole range a whole spectrum along there but but at the end of the day it, it's it's not really healthy for you yeah so you're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Arlene Marshall. My guest today is Derek Brown, and we're talking about mindful drinking. And Derek, I just want to reiterate this idea that you we want to own, we want to recognize that lots of people do lots of things every day that are not necessarily soft quotes here healthy, but that have some other benefit, pleasure, enjoyment, some other value in their life which I think you and I are of like mind that that doesn't mean that that thing is bad. It just means that you want to ha make an intention choice around its place in your life. Right. That's right. And you don't want to let things like stress or peer pressure or habit mm. rule the way that you drink because those are, those are bad leaders. They don't really help you in the long run. You know, alcohol does not relieve stress. It may immediately, but in the long term, it actually causes more stress. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, peer pressure is never really a good reason to do something that could be potentially dangerous to your body. Yeah, um, and so I think, yeah, you have to you have to just, you know, I think it's going back to this idea, like who taught you how to drink? You know, I think that that's a really important question. Um, and so I guess I'd ask you, who taught you? How oh, to drink? as soon as you said it, I knew I my first three instances of full intoxication happened with family. Um, you know, first my brothers, then at big family functions, and I was underage. And so when I went away to college, 
all I knew was binge drinking. And guess what I did? <laughs> and, and we have a family history of alcoholism. So it was maybe not the best set of priming experiences, to your point, that I was learning behaviors from my environment that I now have had to work really hard to reprogram in the way that you're talking about. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. And the same same for me. You know, my I, I was handed a beer bong and like, here, this is fun. You know, brothers, it brothers. Fun, <laughs> but it, then it was unfun. You know, yeah, like it, really unfun. It, it, it it had its pluses and it had its minuses, and the minuses some sometimes added up more than the pluses. But but I think that it was it came down to like you know, it, when you, theoretically your parents, not your parents, anybody's parents should sit them down and talk to them about sex, right? They should say, here's what it is. Here are the ramifications of it. Here's what pregnancy is, Here, you know, like, and, and go through a discussion about something that's so important and vital to our life. It, it is our life, right? But nobody sits down necessarily. And I, if you do, if you're the one out there that does that, then, you know, slow clap. Yeah, that's amazing. Out. But <laughs> so, yeah, reach out. Um, you're the next up on the show. But th for, for most people, they don't get that talk. It's either you know, don't do it or overindulge. And so this is really just saying like, hey, you know, stop, think about it. I'm not asking you to do much. I'm just asking you to, to be aware of how you want to feel and your intentions. And there's all kinds of ramifications that come out of not being aware of it that are, that are like I said, dangerous, that are, 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 are troublesome. And so I think that it's important for that reason to be aware of it. But what I like about mindful drinking versus sort of responsibility messaging or things that are, this is about an intrinsic motivation. And this is something I learned from you, actually. And I learned from um, my course, shout out to CWC, is that I, um, <laughs> you know, is, is this external motivation is just not really always working for us, right? Like I mentioned, the, like the scare tactics of showing crash cars and dead bodies and, um, you know, this sort of like finger wagging, don't do this, you know, those don't seem to work very well. Um, but when you say, okay, this is what I want for me, this is what my evening looks like. And that's, this is what it looks like the next day for me, especially if you are interested in health and wellness and, and fitness or what have you, you know, like it's hard to wake up the next morning and be successful at what you want to do at your goals. If you are over drinking. Yeah. I think I keep coming back to this question of intentionality of like, why are you drinking? And your, to your point, it's, am I drinking because I've been programmed to right? some kind of social priming? Obviously, that's what I was just saying about my own parents. Um, am I drinking because of external pressures? That's the peer pressure stuff or because I should or because people think I'm weird. Like that's all external. Um, what do you think are actually intrinsic motivators to drink? You know, we're over here being like, it's not healthy, but people still <laughs> do it. Like, what is the internal aligned choice look like? Well, I think, I hope a lot of people experience this over the holidays. I mean, I think one of the mm. healthiest things that I know that we can do is be together and celebrate together, right? And so I think that that's definitely that, that aspect of celebration is a really good one. You know, mm. um, conviviality, being with somebody that you care about, having that great conversation um, at a bar, at a restaurant, at wherever. And and the thing is that alcohol can be part of it, but it doesn't have to be, but it is appropriate in that scenario, right? It's certainly like if you cheers and had a sparkling wine or champagne for, for New Year's Eve, that makes sense. That's a really nice time to do it. You're really welcoming in the, the New Year more you, right? <laughs> New like Year that. more you. Yeah, I so, take that from Jerry. So I think that's good. Yeah, I mean... Uh, you know, there's there's other reasons too. I think that uh, the there's sort of like consecration. There's religious reasons. You know, people for different holidays, whether you know, in a, a variety of religions. I think about like Passover and Judaism, or you know, um, the uh, sacrament and Catholicism. Um, and and so you know, drinking wine is part of that, and that's okay. You know, and then then there's certainly the um, connoisseurship. You know, the fact that there are really delicious alcohol products out there uh, and some of those are our cultural you know like some of them yeah. belong to our heritage and our culture they're, they're cultural food ways you know whether you're thinking about like agave based products from mexico like you know ricea mezcal tequila you know or you're thinking about the brandies and cognacs of, of france i mean these are 
these are delicious and interesting in their own right. They light up our brains in, in wonderful ways when we just drink a complex beverage, you know? Okay. And I think that that's cool and I think that's wonderful. I do want to put one asterisk on all of that. Yeah. Those are appropriate way, you know, places to drink those. And in all cases, you can drink something else too, right? Oh, so yeah. on uh, New Year's Eve, I drank a uh, sparkling wine alternative <laughs> That was from the Swabian Alps of Germany, made Ooh. by a producer named Jörg Geiger, with forged ingredients from that area. Like, I mean, it was so special and unique, and it was delicious, you know, that I didn't miss not having, like, my grower champagne, you know. Um, and then, you know, if you're doing, obviously, you know, like, if you are doing a, a sort of connoisseurship, there are wonderful non-alcoholic beers, wines, so forth, ready-to-drink cocktails, cocktails cocktails um, <laughs> Dar- for those the- just on audio that's Derek holding up a copy of his book mindful mixology <laughs> so i think that like there's lots of really cool and interesting things to drink and so in all of those scenarios you don't have to drink i'm but so all of those scenarios they- it's appropriate to you circling back to normalizing you know i know that you and i have also talked about extensively the experience of going out to eat, going out to a bar, wanting a low or no alcohol cocktail, not being able to get anything more interesting than like a tonic and lime and how frustrating not only that can be, but also the experience of uh, even having a bartender mock you um, or other people around you, you know, assuming that you may have um, a problematic relationship with alcohol just because you're choosing not to drink. And I know one of the things I was hoping to do having you on the show was just normalizing the choice. Uh, I think you like the word sober-ish. And I really have embraced that word myself. Um, And the push to give adults who don't want alcohol a tasty option. That's right. Yeah, they deserve complex, sophisticated drinks. And and it's creeping its way. Actually, I'd say it's not creeping, barreling its way into... Yeah, uh, bars and bar restaurants and and hospitality spaces and stadiums and shopping uh, you know centers. It's it's everywhere now. That's really great. I mean, I don't you know, dry January like um, in 2015 was like practically desolate. You know, like it was like these like dust bunnies flying. On. You're like, oh, is there a not you know a non alcoholic beer out there? I can have- <laughs> oh, duels, great. You know, oh, it's terrible, but it's it's okay. You know, um, but now there's like everything is available you know there's so many wonderful products and there's still you know you have to some of them you have to hunt for the better ones um but it's out there and bars and restaurants are starting to 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 stock them and bartenders are getting wise to this but i I could definitely uh, see that like from the other side of the bar it's scary to order things that everybody's going to kind of pick at you about right and it's scary when you're like i'll take a non-alcoholic cocktail and and they look at you kind of you know, from the side and your friend goes, Oh, are you okay? Is everything all right? <laughs> Do you need help? Do like, you talk? <laughs> I'm, I have a meeting tomorrow morning. Like I don't feel like it, you know? And so I think it's really important to normalize it so that people can just get on with their lives and explain to people, whoever they want to explain to how they feel in their life story, but don't have to explain their entire life just to order a drink. And so I think that that's a really important thing. Um, and this getting the information out there, it's spreading in dry, dry January this year. I, I looked at like the Washington Post the other day. There were like five articles um, on dry January. I was like, this is amazing. It's really changing. And and I think that's important to keep pushing it and providing context for it, like, like and, you're helping to do today. And like you're saying, content for it, right? Like you're out mm-hmm. there teaching other practitioners how to make a good, interesting, what did you say? Sophisticated and um, uh, interesting? I think what was the other, interesting and sophisticated? No, what was your phrase? Complex, sophisticated. Complex, there we go. Complex and sophisticated. Um, You know, you're out there teaching the skill set, the ideas, the underpinning to create the opportunity. And I think that deserves its shout out too. Um, you're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Arlie Marshall. My guest is Derek Brown. We're talking about mindful drinking. Uh, and you are, in my opinion, the very best person to be talking about mindful drinking. You are out there in the world hustling to craft a new space for all of us to step into. Um, you mentioned a moment ago that it's dry January. 
And I'm very curious to hear, what do you hope that people who take this month seriously um, take away from it come February 1st? I, I think that the single best thing that they could take away from this month is that you could enjoy your life and all of the positive emotions that come with going out and being with people and connecting with people and drinking delicious things and being in a beautiful space, all of that is possible with or without alcohol, right? That's it. I don't, I, I think, you know, for some people, dry January might be a lifeline, right? Like mm. for those people who are struggling um, with aspects of, of alcohol, consumption, you know, they might need this month to really look at themselves um, yeah. and spend time away from alcohol to make the decisions they need to make to, to, to be the person they want to be. But I think that, you know, for most of us, what it's about is just taking time off to, you know, celebrate in a different way, you know. Um, so I really try to tell people that the goal is not to avoid, like, say, just like, set a goal to avoid things right say i'm not i'm not ever i'm not going to drink right that's what this month is about not drinking alcohol i say what's a better way is is this sort of approach goals right this idea that i am going to drink and try stuff that i've never tried before these wonderful products that don't have alcohol or if you're doing what they call damp january Ooh. or dryish january dry -ish. low <laughs> low alcohol <laughs> products right you, there's just an array of interesting new products like instead of focusing on what you're not drinking, focusing on what you can drink, you know, and there's a lot of new interesting stuff out there. Yeah. As you say that, um, you know, I'm thinking about the, the low alcohol as opposed to, you know, we, we think of it as ubiquitous, right? A drink is a drink, but you had an article recently and forgive me. I don't remember where it was, where was it? Was it Epicurious? E Epicurious. Yeah. Okay. So you had an article in Epicurious where you talked about, we don't know how much alcohol's in what we're drinking. Right. Like you can measure a steak in ounces and know how big the steak is. But if you mix me a cocktail and hand it to me, I don't know the potency. I can read it on my beer if I buy a beer at a store, but I don't know out in the world. And very recently, I was out with one of my friends who um, ripple effect. My knowing you, I talked to her about some of our conversations. She and I decided together to go low alcohol. We went out to dinner. We ordered a drink. And the waiter actually said to us, well, you know, that doesn't have very much alcohol in it. Like, <laughs> as if that was a problem that we weren't aware of. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, that's the point, champ. <laughs> um, so I just think speaking to the low alcohol, what did you just call it? Like damp January? It sounds awful. Damn, ja I, January is damp and dark enough. <laughs> every name that's ever come up. Dry January is okay. But for a while, they're trying to call it dry January. That was bad. Damp. January, I'm nope. not sure if it's going to stick, but nope, nope, uh, nope. ultimately, this is what the kids are saying. Uh, well, we ain't the kids anymore, but <laughs> I'm gonna, like, let's, kids, we can do better. So I, if I'm, you know, I'm projecting myself into to January 31st, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gazing ahead into Valentine's Day and I'm thinking about these questions of like, okay, why do I drink? I want to drink more mindfully. Like, what does the practice of mindful drinking look like if someone's bringing it to bear in their life? I mean, I think it, it, it really starts with that idea that, you know, why do I drink? Just sitting down and, and for some people, it's very useful to journal about it. I, that's what mm -hmm. I do, right? I write about it. I sit down and write, these are the reasons. And I look at them and I say, are those good reasons or those bad reasons? You know, for me, not do they are they good or bad in the world is is almost irrelevant it's to me are they good or bad are they working for the person that i want to be and so yeah. i think you know writing about them but you don't have to write about them if you don't like writing you know you could bu bullet points or just go sit in a corner somewhere and think about it for a minute like why am i doing this you know and so i think that that really is the beginning of it all but 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 i think once you've done that and once you feel comfortable this is the way i want to drink um and this is how i want to show up um, then I think that sometimes it's still hard, right? Like you, you might go to a party and then all of a sudden, you know, like you're resolved. You're like, I'm not drinking this evening. It's cool. I'll just have soda water if I need to, you know, um, I'll exit if I need to, whatever, but you get there and then somebody hands you a shot. And then again, you have to face every fear in your life. You know, like I have to tell this person about my entire life story and explain to them why I'm not doing this. Um, but really you can find a lot of different ways 
to do that. For one, you can bring non-alcoholic beer to the party. I did that recently. I went to a um, a party with my son's uh, friends and parents, and the guy is a makes beer at home. I knew he's going to have lots of um, you know beer and lots of alcohol there, uh, but I didn't know he'd have non-alcoholic stuff, so I brought my own six pack um, along with a bottle of champagne for them. And um, then I pulled it out and he's like, oh my God, I got this stuff. And, and then we were talking about it. And so it actually turned out pretty well. But, but so that's, that's the one way to do it. I mean, you can certainly do something where you just kind of like pretend you're drinking. You know, like I, I, I don't advocate lying in any instance, but in this case, you can maybe put something in a shorter glass with a lime on it. It looks like a gin and tonic. You can have a tonic water if you don't have non-alcoholic stuff and then people don't ask you or or if they hand you a shot you say oh i've already got a drink i'm good um yeah you know i'm driving i'm taking antibiotics i'm you know whatever there's all lots of things that you can say um so i think you know if you're having trouble explaining it to people you feel uncomfortable in that scenario which a lot of people do it turns out then i think that it's it's worthwhile to come armed with a couple of excuses you know um yeah and I think you you said something that's ringing a bell in my mind that as you become more comfortable with that moment, that decision, that set of decisions, um, that it actually can be a point of connection in the same way that alcohol can be, right? Because you showed up with the six pack, you pulled it out. This guy's like, oh, I do have some. Like, that's an interesting point of connection that came from the opposite side of the coin. And, you know, like I said, that now my friend and I have this story about this waiter, right? Like, not drinking is also a social choice in a completely different way than drinking is a social choice. That's right. I mean, you could, yeah. I mean, there's been so many times that I was afraid. I mean, as somebody who mm. is a bartender, who is an expert on alcohol, I was in a situation where I was afraid to tell people that I wasn't drinking or mm. that, um, you know, I was an advocate for it because there's situations where, where people, people judge you on it you know like people get defensive so I, too they get defensive yeah i mean i think for a lot of people they think you're taking something away from them um and so I think you're judging them right like i think the other thing is that people think if you're not drinking you're judging their choices um in a similar way to a lot of ways that we push the message of other kinds of behavioral abstinence or you know, the way that we glorify and idealize soft quotes here, healthy choices in our culture. Ultimately, what we're projecting is like, my choices are good and your choices are bad. So people think that we're judging them or we're making a statement about them. And then that makes them defensive instead of one of the things I love about your body of work is it's like, hey, do what is good for you. We're not here to judge you. We're just here to make better choices for ourselves. That, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and in the process, with that fear, when I've been able to overcome that fear and have the conversation with somebody, nine out of 10 times, it turns out beautifully. And instead of it being a confrontation, the person is usually like, I know somebody in my life who has problems with alcohol. I myself have had problems with alcohol. I am actually not drinking either. Ha ha, this is not a gin and tonic. It's a soda and water. It's just know. tonic. <laughs> right. So there's 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 just an array of things that happen. And then you you get into a conversation with somebody and you really find a connection there. So I think that, you know, and 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 I I don't need to go into too great a detail for this, but but you know, I don't drink right now. Um I, I I'm not I don't identify as an alcoholic in that sense. That was never part of my uh, perspective, but I always say, maybe I'll drink again. I don't know. You know, like I'll leave it open. But but right now I don't. And part of the reason for that is because there were times in my life where, where alcohol was a problem. Um, and so, you know, I've had to think about that and my choices very carefully and come up with ways that I could show up in the world in the way the person that I wanted to be. Um, and so, you know, underlying all of this is is me trying to selfishly create options for myself. I have to admit, <laughs> admit it, it, it's here on the show. I'm selfish and that's the reason why. I just want more. Yep, it's just selfish peeps. That's just <laughs> that's all this. You know, thank, thank you for sharing that with our listeners because I think that, you know, for me, it's always been this perspective of your brave choices, your willingness to show up authentically as yourself and that you're not out there judging anybody. And to me, that makes you even more powerful of a voice and a practitioner. And I've always admired that about you. Thank you. Um, so 
You're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Arlene Marshall. My guest, who I'm clearly gushing over, is Derek Brown, and we're talking about mindful drinking. But I want to pivot here as we're getting close to our time together and talk about something else that has come up in our conversations um, when you're talking about like things that you've been scared of. Yeah. And I said when I did your intro that your mission is to teach America how to drink, mm -hmm. which is a pretty ambitious statement. And the first time you said it to me, I had a very strong reaction. And then you confided in me that you were afraid to say it publicly. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I've caveat to the listeners. I have his permission to share this with all of you. We screened this question before because I wanted to make sure that you were cool with it. But I think it's really common for many of us to feel a sense of passion and purpose and calling that can feel overwhelming and scary. And from out here, you feel like this confident, um, very well-informed, very well-researched. We didn't get too deep into any one topic, but you know, shout out for the listener. Derek is a huge nerd and he knows <laughs> any topic you get Derek to talk about, he can speak all the way down to the ground level of history and theory and science and just like anything. Um, I try. For you, when you shared with me that that mission of teaching America how to drink felt arrogant or too big to share, it, it blew me away because you clearly are the person to have that voice. And so where I'm going with this is, First off, thank you for letting me share it with the listeners. But second, what advice would you give to someone who has that big courage, that big calling, that big sense of purpose to the point that it actually kind of scares them a little bit? Mm -hmm. What advice would you give them in that moment? Well, like I said, it was really scary. And I think that the reason scary it was scary is because it was so real to me, right? I knew that it was something that was burning inside of me and that I wanted to talk about and I wanted to do. And um, I know I had been through something or some things that some other people have gone through too, but not, not in the same way that I have, right? Alcohol has been there at the best and the worst parts of my life, right? And so I think that I have this really particular um, perspective that I can share with people about this topic. You know, and so um, when we were talking about that, I think what I realized is this is so big and it's something I really want to do. And it's something that I think will connect with a lot of people. Um, what got me over the hump is realizing that there's only one me who's gone th through this experience. There's only one person who's had the exact experience that I have had. Um, and there, well, while it's not true, I'm the only one talking about this, you know, I think that it's giving me a unique perspective I can share. And so as I've opened up, all I've gotten is people opening back up to me, right? So recently I had a friend of mine who is in the industry in a very big way, um, reach out and call me and said, hey, I gotta talk to you. I was like, yeah, what's going on? He's like, I, I don't think I'm an alcoholic, but I have a problem with drinking. Mm. and. And in that moment, I was like, this is it. This is why I do this, right? And I'm not a re recovery specialist, right? I, I wasn't able, I'm not able to hold his hand through the recovery process if that's where he goes. All I can do is share my story and the resources that I use, you know? Um, but in that moment, I was like, this is it. You know, this is what I have to do. Um, and so part, a big part of that is just, re, you know, putting it out there in the world and, you know, uh, see how it comes back to you. Um, I don't know how that gets you past the fear sometimes, right? I think sometimes it's just one of those moments where you're at the cliff and you jump or you don't. You know exactly what happens if you don't jump. That's, you know, so, so that part doing. is already known, right? The other <laughs> yeah. part is not known and is really, that's what, exactly why it's scary. But, but when you do it, the reward can be incredible. And so far, if I never talked about this subject again, I would still have received all of the reward I need from just a few people reaching out to me and saying, this helped them. Oh, and I think it's so much more than even those people, right? There's all of the people that didn't reach out that you've helped. And, you know, I always think of the Sia, the Sia lyric, like feel the fear and do it anyway, yeah. right? Like sometimes I think the scariest callings are the ones that are gonna be most impactful. Um, so thank you 
so much for sharing that, but also just for doing it anyway. Like I love so much about your work and it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, my hope is that it resonates far and wide. So when it does, where can our listeners find you? Um, I have a website called Positive Damage Inc. Inc. dot com. Coolest That's my name ever. And um, I'm on social media and Instagram as Positive Damage Inc. Dot, uh, uh, dot, dot com. Just Positive Damage Inc. <laughs> uh, and on Twitter as Positive DMG because they won't give you enough letters to spell out <laughs> because, damaging. Because anyone is still on Twitter. We'll leave that one for also getting sued. <laughs> well, I, and I, 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 wanna, I wanna throw in one more thing because you said yeah. a few times how like, you're like, oh, I love your work. I'm gushing about it, blah, blah, blah. You do. I mean, I, I have not made it clear to everybody what a fanboy I am of Darlene. Oh I my God, totally <laughs> a disciple, if you will, of, of her and all the great work that you're doing. And I have learned so much from you and I continue to learn so much from you. So thank you. You're welcome. And I'm also really grateful to Eric for leaving the camera on you instead of on me <laughs> as I like folded into myself like a chair. <laughs> but, but thank you, Derek. I appreciate that very much. You're um, welcome. You know, you know, I struggle at receiving compliments. It's hard. Um, so thank you so much for joining us on the show. And if you as one of our listeners have questions, thoughts, feedback, of course, go follow Derek. Positive Damage is his company. But you could also email me. I'm info at Darlene.coach. You can find me on Instagram, also Darlene.coach. Or check out that new Substack, coachdar.substack.com. And if you're a fan of the show, I hope that you are already subscribed. But if you haven't, you should do that. If you're watching on, you on YouTube, hit that like button and leave us a review. Because if you leave us a review, the algorithm will promote us. Let's game the algorithm together and help the show grow in 2023. Thank you. Be well and happy new year, everybody.